Aquí de nuevo con ustedes, vamos a la información internacional, dentro de la cual podemos tomar como de la mayor relevancia las declaraciones del Papa Francisco pronunciadas en su reciente visita a Cuba. Para ello les compartimos el contenido visual que nos proporciona el portal Democracy Now. En la voz y conducción de Amy Goodman, vamos a la información. And that does it for the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ahead of his first U.S. visit, Pope Francis celebrated Mass in Cuba Sunday before hundreds of thousands of worshippers in Havana's Revolution Square. Born in Argentina, Francis is the first Latin American pope. He's widely praised in Cuba for helping to broker secret talks with Washington that resulted in the further normalization of U.S.-Cuban relations. After arriving in Cuba Saturday, Pope Francis praised the detente between the two countries as, quote, an example of reconciliation for the entire world. World. During Sunday's Mass in Havana, Pope Francis called on Catholics to be of service to one another. People of flesh and blood, people with individual lives and stories, and with all their frailty, these are those whom Jesus asks us to protect, to care for, to serve, because being a Christian entails serving the dignity of your brothers and sisters, to fight for our brothers and sisters' dignity, and to live for the dignity of your brothers and sisters. That is why Christians are constantly called to set aside their own wishes and desires, their pursuit of power, and to look instead to those who are most vulnerable. There is a kind of service which truly serves others, yet we need to be careful not to be tempted by another kind of service, a service which is self-serving. There is a way to go about serving which is interested in only helping my people in the name of our people. This service always leaves your people outside and gives rise to a process of exclusion. The Pope's homily in Havana included no direct political message besides urging the successful conclusion of Colombia peace talks that have been taking place in Cuba for nearly three years. After the mass, Pope Francis met former Cuban leader Fidel Castro at his home. The Pope, who is Jesuit, gave Castro a collection of sermons by Castro's former Jesuit teacher, the Reverend Amando Llorente, and two CD recordings of the Spanish priest speaking. The Pope also met with President Raul Castro at the Palace of Revolution. On Tuesday, Pope Francis arrives in Washington, where he'll address Congress and meet with President Obama. According to some accounts, Pope Francis had initially wanted to begin his U.S. trip by crossing the Mexican border to show support for immigrants, but the plan had to be scrapped for logistical reasons. After Washington, the Pope heads to New York and Philadelphia. Over the weekend, the Vatican released a short video of Pope Francis speaking in English about his Philadelphia stop. I look forward to greeting the pilgrims and the people of Philadelphia when I come for the World Meeting for Families. I will be there because you will be there. See you in Philadelphia. To talk more about Pope Francis's Cuba and U.S. trips, we're joined by two guests. In Havana, Dr. Carlos Alzugaray Treto, a former Cuban diplomat who attended the Pope's Mass in Havana Sunday and has closely followed the Pope's visit. Dr. Treto is a scholar and writer and former Havana University professor. Here in New York, we're joined by Andrea Bartoli. The community of Sant'Echigidio is the group he is with, a liberal Catholic group active in international affairs. He's the representative to the UN and the United States. Bartoli is also the dean of the school. School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. We welcome you both to Democracy Now!, but let's begin in Havana. Um, Dr. Tretto, can you talk about what happened on Sunday, the mass in Havana's Revolution Square? Describe the scene for us and what the Pope said. Well, I think, Emmy, thank you for having me. I think um, first you have to describe the city the day before. It's very important because it was a Saturday and every, everything was very subdued, like everyone was in the expectation of what was going to happen on Sunday. 
uh, p uh, night places were, were not full of patrons. Patrons simply stayed at home and got ready for the mass. Uh, the mass was attended by a large number of Cubans. I think it's interesting because it underlines the very complex re religiosity of the Cuban people. Uh, I bet that there were many practicing Catholics, and as a matter of fact, communion was handed out all over the, the Plaza de la Revolución. But at the same time, there were many curious people who simply were attracted by the figure of the Pope. This is the first Latin American Pope. His position in international affairs is quite different from what we have seen in the past, because the Pope has aligned itself in the big debates of the world today, the, the Pope has aligned itself with the poor people, with the underdeveloped countries. But his message at the plaza was basically a, a Catholic message. And, and under on, no doubt that it helped the Catholic Church in Cuba. The Catholic Church in Cuba is not very influential, mainly because it had been always in the national debates on the wrong side. But now the Church is aligning itself with the with the, uh, with the right side. And it's interesting because, to a great extent, it is the Vatican that has promoted that position of the Church. And even though at the Mass yesterday, the Pope simply kept going a message of solidarity, of uh, um, getting together, but the Cardinal, Cardinal Jaime Ortega, mentioned the fact that the Church was playing a role in the uh, normalization of relations with the United States, and, uh, and the Church, through Cardinal Ortega, very distinctly uh, stepped on the side of normalization. And this is important because there was a large delegation of Cuban Americans from Miami and other places in the United States. I personally met with uh, um, the Bishop of Miami, uh, Archbishop Wensky, and there were lots of Cuban Americans who some years ago wouldn't have dreamed to come to Cuba, and now they are here in Cuba being part of this process. As a matter of fact, many of them have left for Olguin to be present at the Mass uh, today in Olguin. And describe the mass that you attended, what Revolution Square was like on Sunday, and then talk about the significance of the meeting between the pope, between Pope Francis, the first Latin American pope, and Fidel Castro at his home with his family. Okay, the mass, the mass was full of people. I was surprised by the number of young people who are Catholic, who are believing Catholic. This is important for the Church, because in the past the Church has never crossed the threshold of maybe 10 percent of the population being practicing Catholics. So it was a manifestation of uh, the growing influence of the Church, although my, my opinion is that it's not something that will continue to grow forever, because there are obviously limits of what the Church can, uh, can be part of. Maybe the most significant one was the meeting the Pope had yesterday in the afternoon in front of the Centro Felix Varela uh, uh, with uh, young people in Cuba. So I think the important thing here is the Church is being growing, but it's siding uh, in cooperation with the government, and this is very significant. There is no let's say, open conflict, although the Church would like more, more presence, and that presence is being achieved with the help of the Vatican. Now, my view of the, of the uh, meeting with Fidel is very interesting. I mean, Fidel, uh, since 1985, when he gave the interview to Frey Beto and appeared in a book called Fidel and Religion, he has come out as a, as a person who has studied in Catholic schools. I myself went to Belen, just like Fidel. And, and I have a lot of respect for the Jesuits, for, for the way that the Jesuits have uh, helped us uh, learn more and, and be constructive. So, uh, which was not the case, by the way, in the Belen that Fidel and me met, because at that time Belen was quite conservative. But, um, you know, there is such a coincidence between the political positions of Fidel Castro in the world stage, and Raul Castro for that matter, and uh, the position of the Pope. It's for equality, for the poor, for uh, advancing progressive uh, agenda worldwide. So I, I see it as part of that. Uh, and as 
this continuous relationship that began many years ago, especially when in 1998 Pope John Paul visited Cuba and the connection between John Paul and, and, and Fidel was so good. So this continues to happen today. Remember when, when the Pope arrived in Cuba, the first thing, the Pope Francis arrived in Cuba, the first thing he said at his speech, please, Mr. President, give, uh, um, give my greetings to your brother, Fidel Castro, which, of course, is kind of contradictory with the original position of the church in the early years of the revolution because the church sided with the United States with the upper classes against the revolution and that situation continued, continued in the 60s and the 70s. It started to change in the 80s but both sides approached each other since the 80s and, and I think this, is, this was underlined by everything that the Pope did yesterday but especially by his meeting Fidel Castro who is after all is the historical leader of the Cuban revolution. We're going to come back to this discussion with Dr. Carlos Azugra Treto, former Cuban diplomat, and we'll also be joined here in New York by Dr. Andrea Bartoli, um, who is the dean uh, of public uh, uh, diplomacy at Seton Hall University. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute.